what Keith and Chris asked me to talk about tonight was establishment and renovation of full season forage stands. And uh, we, we've had a kind of a wet, wet summer, I mean, wet early spring, late winter, early spring in Kentucky. And then we had a pretty, pretty substantial dry period uh, in many parts of Kentucky uh, during the summer months. And we just started to get rain again and, and we've got a lot of rain. So it, it seems like um, on average, we're doing pretty well. Uh, when I was at Virginia Tech, our economists used to say that an average is kind of like having one foot in a bucket of uh, ice cold water, one foot in a bucket of scalding hot water. On average, you're comfortable, but it hurts like hell. And that's kind of what our, our weather patterns have been this year. And we've played havoc with a lot of forage stands around the state. And, and I want to talk a little bit about um, establishment and renovation of cool season forage stands. And, and uh, if you have questions, please save them and we'll, uh, we'll answer them at the end. I'll be on here as long as you all want to stay on the, in, in chat. The other thing is, is I'll give you my contact information at the end. And, and you all are always welcome to call. Um, I always encourage people to use their local extension agents because they have great local knowledge and um, they know your farm and your area and what works and what doesn't work in that area. Um, but, but you're welcome to call me too if you have questions. A lot of times, um, especially if you're coming back to a farm or, or you bought a new farm or a new piece of ground, it, it's been kind of abandoned or neglected. And, and a lot of times people will come in and they will cut hay for years and never put any fertilizer on and drag the fertility levels down. And the next thing you know, you got to, what you have in this picture is kind of a big, a big field of room stage. And, um, and the question is, is what do you do with a situation like this? And, and what we want to talk about tonight is, is about renovation. Um, I'm going to focus primarily on renovation of, of pastures and hay fields. In, in the picture we always have when we talk about renovation is reseeding. And, and one thing I want to stress tonight is that renovation doesn't always mean reseeding. A lot of times it doesn't mean reseeding at all. There's um, a lot of other things that we need to talk about when we talk about pasture renovation. And what I really want to talk about tonight is an integrated approach to pasture and hay field renovation. And it's going to include things like soil fertility and, and grazing management or cutting management in, in the case of uh, hay stands, weed control, overseeding legumes, and then using reseeding kind of as a last resort. A lot of times if we get all of our other ducks in a the row, then we're going to have pretty good success without going in and do it, doing a complete reseeding. So let's get right into it. And, and I'm going to start with one of the important ones. And this is one that's been on everybody's minds because of the fertilizer prices in the last um, two years or so. Uh, we've seen fertilizer prices in the last 18 months more than double, triple in some cases. And that's really kind of put a crunch on producers in terms of applying needed fertility to um, pastures and especially to hay fields. And we'll talk about why hay fields are so important when it comes to soil fertility in a minute. I always like to start out with Liebig's law, the minimum, and, and uh, what, what von Liebig said was that the level of plant production can be no greater than that allowed by the most of limiting of essential plant growth factors. And there's lots of different plant growth factors. Could be a fertilizer like potassium or phosphorus or nitrogen. It, it could be soil moisture, could limit overall plant, could be soil acidity, um, uh, and, and it could be temperature. But whatever factors the most limiting is going to limit overall pasture pr production. Why am I telling you this? I'm, I'm telling you this because we can't, when we talk about soil fertility, we can't pick and choose one thing to focus on. We've got to have kind of a balanced approach to soil fertility so that we're, we're not limiting production with one single factor. And this is just a graphical depiction of, of Liebig's law of the minimum. And, and this is a barrel. And essentially, all the staves are different nutrients or a different plant growth factor. Whatever the lowest stave is, it doesn't matter how much of the other um, nutrients we, we or lime we pour into the system, whatever that limiting stave is, is, is going to limit overall production. 
And that holds true for both pastures and hay fields. So our, our job in the soil fertility program is to go in and identify what those limiting factors are and correct those so that we're not holding overall production back. Now, um, I, I always like to put this up to remind people that when we make hay, we remove a tremendous amount of nutrients. If, if you take a look here at orchard grass, for example, if we have a good orchard grass yield, so say we're yielding three tons of, of uh, hay from that orchard grass field in a good year, we're removing 150 pounds of, of nitrogen, we're removing about 45 or 50 pounds of P205, and we're removing 150 to 180 pounds of, of potash. I can almost always tell you when somebody brings me a soil test and I look at that soil test and it's low in potash, I can, I can tell you whether that's a hay field or not because we normally don't put enough potash back on our fields to maintain soil test levels. And, and um, I encourage people to, but, but often we, we don't get enough back on those fields. So I just wanted to take a look at, at the value of those nutrients in, in hay. And, and I think this is really important as we move forward that we recognize that hay not only has a feeding value, but it also has a, a fertilizer value. If we assume that we're removing a ton of hay, 40 pounds of nitrogen, 15 pounds of P2O5, and 55 pounds of K2O, and we assume the following prices, and I got these from the, um, the, the local uh, co-op here in Princeton, uh, 80 cents for nitrogen, 70 cents for P2O5, and, and 73 cents for K2O. And, and we sit down and we do the math, one ton of hay is removing at, at current fertilizer prices about $80 a ton of, new, $80 of nutrients. So one ton of hay is removing about $80 worth of nutrients. So when, when we, if we're selling hay, we've got to price it accordingly to get the cost of those nutrients back. If we're cutting hay, we've got to replace those nutrients to maintain productivity over the long term. Now, in a grazing system, you know, when we feed hay, we need to think about how we feed that hay to, to cash in on the value of the nutrients in that hay. So if, if I'm buying hay and I'm bringing it into my farm, I not only get the feeding value of that hay, but I also get nutrients coming in in that hay. So every ton of hay is going to have that 40 or 50 pounds of nitrogen. It's going to have um, 15 pounds of phosphorus and about uh, 40 to 60 pounds of, of potash, depending on the type of hay per ton. So um, if I take that hay and I feed it in one corner of the pasture all winter long or in a dry lot, I'm not capturing the value of those nutrients. So in order to capture the value of those nutrients in that hay, I have to move those hay feeding points around. First thing I want to do is feed hay on my coarse pastures. So if I've got pastures that, that are in need of fertility, that's where I should be feeding hay at. Um, and then I want to move the feeding points around those pastures. And we can do that a variety of different ways. And we can use bale wagons, we can unroll hay, we can um, move set hay bales out in different places and put hay rings around them. And uh, Greg Halleck at the University of Kentucky has done a lot of work with, with bale grazing. And that's where you actually go in and set hay bales out in um, late fall, early winter when it's still dry, and then go through that field and essentially use a poly wire to ration that hay out to those animals. So normally they'll get some stockpile along with whatever hay that you have on offer there. And um, as they consume that, you move the fence back. So you start at your water source and you move the fence back. And that's called bale grazing. And what that does is it spreads those nutrients out much more evenly across that pasture surface from the hay feeding. One of the beautiful things about cow-calf systems or grazing systems in general is that nutrient removal is fairly low. We look at a cow-calf system, we have inputs coming into that system in the form of fertilizers, uh, manure, um, legumes that fix nitrogen from the air into a plant available form, anything that we feed, mineral so sources, um, any kind of commodity feeds that we use, any kind of hay are all bringing nutrients into the system. And then they get cycled through this system. And um, in 
the, what we export from the system is cats. So about 80 to 90% of the nutrients that go in the front end of the animals coming out the back end of the animal in the system. And then the export of the calves. So we have very, really very little um, removal, nutrient removal from a well-managed grazing system. Um, at the University of Missouri did a study a while back and he found that we remove about, in a cow-calf pair, we'll remove about 10 pounds of nitrogen, about seven pounds of P2O5 and about a pound of K2O. So think about that. If we're stocked at two acres per cow-calf unit, we're removing very small quantity of nutrients from that grazing system. Now we'll have nutrient loss in some other avenues within that system, but overall it's not like we're making hay and removing a tremendous amount of nutrients or growing a row crop and then taking a nutrients off of that field. In, in that nutrient cycling is one of the things that make a, a well-managed cow-calf system or a well-managed grazing system such a beautiful and sustainable thing in the long term. Now, what grazing can do is redistribute nutrients within the system. If we have one large paddock or, or pasture and animals will tend to go out to the far further parts of the pasture and they tend to graze and then they come back to um, shade and water sources and they lay down and they ruminate. And, and then when they get up to go back out again, they, they tend to make a deposit here. And over time, we'll move nutrients from, from out in the pasture and concentrate them in shade and water areas, areas where we, we may feed commodities at. Anything that attracts the animals is going to um, tend to concentrate nutrients. So the question is, is what do we do about this? And the answer is, is that the ideal situation would be is we provide some water out in the pastures and then we subdivide those pastures and we send animals into a paddock, we allow them to graze and, and we say, well, you're gonna to have to put your nutrients back where you found them at in this paddock. And then we'll move to the next one and do the same thing and the same thing. One of the things that we don't talk enough about about rotational stocking systems is that we get a much more uniform nutrient distribution as we graze through pastures. And that's a big benefit of rotational stocking. We talk about increased plant productivity uh, as a, a benefit, but nutrient distribution is a, a pretty big benefit also. So where do we start at? Well, I know everybody's heard this a hundred times, but we really need to soil test pastures. And this quantifies nutrients. It quantifies primarily phosphorus and potassium, not, not nitrogen because nitrogen is a very transient nutrient in uh, soils. It provides us the baseline. Otherwise, we're just we're just guessing it it um, how much fertilizer to apply. And oftentimes, people say, "Well, fertilizer price is so high. There's no way I'm even I, I, I don't need to soil test because the fertilizer prices are too high." But really, when fertilizer prices are high, is the most important time to be soil testing because it allows what's limiting overall pasture growth and really target your fertilizer dollars towards those things that you need in that system that's gonna allow your pastures to be more, more productive. And then we wanna track fertilizer. Um, we wanna track uh, nutrient levels in the soil um, every two to three years with a soil test. Just a quick, quick uh, things to remember about taking a soil test. The, the accuracy of the soil test is only as good as the sample. So if you take one core from the middle of the pasture, then you don't have a very good soil sample. You wanna make sure um, that you get a representative sample of that pasture. And we wanna sample pastures that are uh, less than 20 acres in size, you get about 15 to 20 cores kind of in a zigzag pattern like you see in this uh, photograph here. We always want to use a soil probe. So don't, don't use your hands, don't use a shovel, use a soil probe. We want to make sure that we sample to a four inch depth. That's what our recommendation is at the University of Kentucky. Your extension agents can help you with the recommendation for the uh, University of Tennessee. But, but you want to match your, your soil depth 
with what the sole test calibration has, the sole uh, testing lab has calibrated with. So us in Kentucky is four inches. We want to avoid areas where animals congregate at. So anywhere where animals will congregate around a water, around a mineral feeder, around where you fed hay, uh, shade trees or water, we want to tend to avoid those areas because they animals tend to concentrate nutrients in those areas. And that will give us a, a false reading, not representing the pasture if we include them in the soil sample. And then we wanna make sure we do our paperwork and submit that sample. And if you need help interpreting your soil sample, your extension agent's always available and they can help you interpret the soil sample and figure out what you need to put on your pasture and what factors are most limiting. We have a really nice um, soil sampling publications for hay fields and pastures, and uh, it's fairly new. It's available online. It goes over a lot of things I just talked about, but in a little bit more detail. So I'm, I wanna talk a little bit about um, soil, uh, soil acidity and liming. Soil acidity is still a major factor that limits forage production in the southeastern United States. So states like Kentucky and Tennessee and Virginia, you know, it's still a major factor in limiting production. And it does two things. It reduces nutrient availability in the soil. And, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. And then it reduces nitrogen fixation in the legume. So as, as uh, pH decreases, nitrogen fixation becomes less efficient in legumes. Does two things. When we put lime on a field, it neutralizes soil acidity and it supplies calcium and magnesium. These are general guidelines. And in general, for most pasture situations, if you're between 6 and 6.4, you're in pretty good shape. Now, if I'm trying to grow a grass alfalfa mixture, then I really want to be between 6.5 and 6.8. If I'm growing just grass, then I can drop down to around 6. So this is the impact that um, soil pH has on nutrient availability in the soil. Um, as you can see here, when we're in the, the optimal range of six to 7.0, that's when our nutrients are all most plant available. So for example, the wider the band is, the more plant available it is. As the pH trails down, which we will tend to do in our region of the country, those nutrients become less available. So when we drop down past um, about six, we start to see a decrease in the availability of the phosphorus. The reason I'm showing you this is that the cheapest thing that we can do and the most beneficial thing that we can do is apply lime to our pastures if we need them because they're going to make all of the nutrients in the soil more plant available. Just wanted to mention grazing management. We kind of already talked about that in terms of nutrient distribution, but, but really what grazing management about is about is, is, is helping the animals make the right choice. Sometimes they make bad choices if we don't manage grazing. Okay, let's talk just a little bit about rotational grazing. So when we rotationally graze, we're managing two things in pastures. We're managing the residual leaf area. Um, so how much leaf area is left? The more leaf area that's left after a grazing event, the faster that pasture is going to regrow. We can kind of think of that leaf area as, as a solar panel. So the closer we graze, the smaller that solar panel becomes and the longer it's going to take for that pasture to regrow. Um, so when we rotate, we want to rotate when the shortest grass in the pasture is at, at the proper height, stubble height. So there'll be grass that's above that um, height and that's okay. We want to make sure that we leave the leaf area. The other thing that we manage is our carbohydrate reserves in the plant. We do that by resting pastures between grazing events. And that gives the plant time to, to photosynthesize, capture sunlight, turn it into sugars and carbohydrates, and then um, recharge the, the carbohydrate reserves in the, in the plant. And those carbohydrate reserves are really important because they provide energy for regrowth after stressful events like a drought, like short-term drought, or um, after that plant goes through uh, a hard winter. Having plenty of carbohydrate reserves is really critical for keeping that pasture stand healthy. 
So one of the things we can do in terms of improving and renovating pastures is, is to think about how we're managing grazing and improve our grazing management. The other thing that we can do with rotational grazing is manage botanical composition in the pasture. And, and we have a whole talk on that, but depending on how close and how frequent we graze our pastures, we can shift botanical compositions towards grasses or towards legumes or towards short growing grasses or tall growing grasses, just by how we manage that stocking. Um, rotational grazing is really truly a powerful tool in terms of managing botanical composition of pastures. So, so often we, we talk about implementing rotational stocking and sometimes I think we make it too hard. Um, on most farms, you know, implementing rotational stocking would just mean close, close some gates. And if you start to close some gates and give one pasture time to rest while the other pasture is starting growing and regrowing a little bit, then you've already implemented a, um, a rudimentary rotational stocking system. First thing that has to be in place when you implement a rotational stocking system is that you've got to have the right attitude. You're going to have problems. There's no question about it. You're going to have droughts and floods and, um, and so on. But, but if you have the right attitude, you're going to kind of figure out your way around that problem. You go into it and say, well, this is never going to work. Chances of you being successful are pretty slim. So one thing that's key in implementing rotational stocking is, is water. You've got to have water in the pastures so that you can rotate animals around those pastures. If you only have one water source on the farm, it's going to be very difficult to implement rotational stocking. And your local NRCS or Soil Water Conservation Service can help you with that. A lot of times they will um, pay a, a portion of water development if you fence out um, riparian areas or ponds and so forth. So I would, I would encourage you to talk to your local NRCS if you're thinking about an implementing an improved grazing system. And then again, rotational grazing allows us to manage two things, residual height and rest period. And that's gonna increase not only pasture productivity, but tolerance of those pastures. And we don't talk enough about that. Drought tolerance is something that rotational grazing improves like nutrient distribution that we don't talk enough about. So when we um, graze a plant and rest a plant, we're improving the size of the root system. And that's gonna allow that plant to grow longer into a drought stress and come out of that drought stress faster. That's one of the first things that people notice when they switch from a continuous to rotational stocking system is that their pastures will tend to grow longer into a drought and they'll come out of that drought faster. We also, again, improve nutrient cycles because we get improved nutrient distribution within that grazing system. We can manage botanical composition. Um, and often, you know, people get turned off by rotational grazing because they say, well, I don't wanna move my animals two or three times a week. It, and the answer to that is you don't have to. Um, that system has to meet your wants and needs. So if, if you work off the farm, have a public job off the farm, if you want to move animals on Sunday after church, then you set your system up so that you're moving animals once a week on Sundays. And it's important to build flexibility into grazing systems because a lot of times when people start with rotational stocking, they'll start to see the benefits and then they'll want to intensify management. And by thinking about what you want to do, not just today, but what you want to do in six months or a year or two years and building that into your grazing system is going to give you flexibility to intensify your management as you move forward. Just want to mention weed control on pastures, and I'm, I'm not a weed specialist, I'm just a, a forage specialist, but, but weeds are, are a common problem in pastures, and um, often we, we think of the weed as being a problem, but um, really weeds are a symptom of the problem. You know, a lot of times they're telling us that something that we're doing is not quite right. I always like to talk a little bit about what a, what a weed is. And, uh, and Webster says a weed is a plant that's not valued where it's growing. To, to me, the best definition of weed is something that the cattle won't eat in the pasture. If I can't get a cow to eat it, then, then in my mind, that's a weed in my pasture. If I've got some broadleaf forbs in my pasture and the cattle are utilizing those, I wouldn't want all broadleaf uh, 
weedy forms in my pasture, but a few aren't going to hurt anything for sure. You always assume the weeds are low in nutritional um, value. This is a publication from Ozia Bay at Virginia Tech, and she looked at um, a number of different weeds, including red root pigweed and common ragweed. And, and when they're in a vegetative state, they can actually be fairly digestible and high in crude protein. The problem with having all weeds in a pasture is that they tend to be lower in productivity than our, our improved forage species. So we would definitely not want all weeds, but if we have a few weeds, we can live with a few weeds in pastures. So weeds are often a, a species of opportunity. So what, what that means is that there's sometimes a symptom of some other underlying problem it could be soil fertility, it could be pH, it could be how I'm managing grazing. But, but when there's an open spot, that weed, that weed that's a species of opportunity is going to come into that open spot. It's kind of like the good Lord's band-aid. It's not going to let bare soil stay bare very long. So when we talk about controlling weeds in grazing systems, often the first thing we want to do is reach for the herbicide jug and we want to spray out those weeds in the pasture. We've got some great pasture herbicides now um, and they're very, very effective. But when we spray that weed out, what's it leave? It leaves a hole in that pasture. What grows in a hole in that pasture? A, a weed, right? So, so you can see how it's kind of a revolving door. So we spray it out and then we've got a hole and then we've got another weed and then we spray it out. We've got a hole and we've got another weed. We really have to have an integrated approach to weed control. We have to ask ourselves, well, why do we have weeds in that pasture? Is it an issue with soil fertility? Is it an issue with the type of forage species we have? Is it grazing management? All those things are important in an integrated uh, weed control program. And then herbicides are, are uh, definitely a valuable tool in an integrated program, but they should be the last thing that we're reaching for in those pastures to control those really hard to control weeds. I want to talk a little bit about um, renovating uh, hay fields and pastures by overseeding legumes. And, and legumes are an extremely important part of ecosystems. Um, they fix nitrogen from the air into a plant available form. They do that by forming a symbiotic relationship with rhizobium bacteria. So if you look at the, the roots of this legume plant, we can see these, these pink structures. Those are, are nodules. They're filled with rhizobium bacteria in, that have infected the root and caused the nodule to form. And they form a symbiotic relationship with that plant. In this relationship, those bacteria get a, um, an energy source in the, in the form of um, sugars that are fixed during photosynthesis. And in return, they exchange a nitrogen that those bacteria fix from the air, the air that we breathe, 78% nitrogen, and they share it with the plant. So the plant gets nitrogen, the, um, the bacteria get a place to live on the plant roots and an energy source. So um, legumes tend to increase yields in grazing systems. They tend to reduce our dependence on nitrogen fertilizer. In a well-managed grazing system, we can develop quite a strong nutrient cycle it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a while to develop it, but if we have legumes and we have good grazing management, um, we can develop a, a very strong nutrient cycle that makes us less dependent on nitrogen fertilizer. In hay fields, we can definitely make mixtures with legumes, and we should be making mixtures with legumes um, to reduce our de dependency on nitrogen fertilizer. They improve high uh, forage quality and, and subsequently animal performance. Have improved summer growth if we have a deep rooted legume like alfalfa or even Cerecia lespidiza in grazing systems. And then they dilute the endophyte and tall fescue. And what we found is that they're actually doing more than, than diluting it. Red clover has been found to have a compound called isoflavones. And those isoflavones actually will reverse the vasoconstriction, so when an animal eats tall fescue infected with a toxic endophyte, there's a toxin or govaline that causes the vascular system of the animal to actually shrink or constrict. Um, red clover actually has a vasodilator, so it actually allows those uh, vascular systems to, to 
uh, dilate back out and allows the animal to cool itself more efficiently. Different legumes fix different amounts of nitrogen. And, and, uh, it, and I put up this up here for two reasons. One, I want you to realize the value of legumes in grazing systems. So if we look at something like red clover and a white clover mixture, we're going to be uh, fixing somewhere between um, 75 and, and 200 pounds of nitrogen in, in a, uh, per acre per year. And that's going to have a monetary value of 70 cents nitrogen. You know, we were looking at somewhere between 50 and $150 for that nitrogen that that legume was bringing into the system. The, the other reason I put this up here is that I, I don't want you to think that putting legumes in your pasture is the same as throwing a, a bag of ammonium nitrate out. It's, it's not exactly the same. Um, that nitrogen has to be shared from the legume plant to the grass plant, and it's shared indirectly through the nitrogen cycle. So the, the animals will graze that legume plant, ingest it, and then um, deposit dung and urine on the soil surface, and the nitrogen will be deposited is shared through that dung and urine. So animals in a grassland ecosystem, animals are an important part and their grazing is an important part of that nitrogen cycle. It's also shared through definite de decomposition of plant parts. So the animals don't eat all the legume plants. They often trample them or the, uh, the leaves and nests and the um, roots nodules slough off and they're all releasing nitrogen into the system. This, this cycle doesn't develop overnight, but it develops over time with good management. And it's an important way to wean ourselves off of commercial fertilizer and grazing systems. The thing that I want you to take home is that there's really direct transfer of nitrogen between a grass and legume plant. It's, it's mostly indirect sharing. So let's talk about the, the practical part of getting legumes back into pastures. And so I'm going to take you through a few steps. And, and um, I think it's important to talk about these because legumes are such an important part of uh, grazing systems. So the, the nitrogen fixation process is only second and most important biochemical process on Earth after photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is the most important biochemical process on Earth. So how do we get legumes back into our pastures? And the first thing we have to do is suppress the sod. And, and there's various ways to do that, but we want to reduce residue. So, so get that plant residue off so the legume seed can get in contact with the soil. And, um, and we want to suppress that sod. And the best way to do that with, is with hard grazing prior to overseeding those pastures or interseeding those pastures. And this is the only time that I'll tell you to abuse your pasture is, is when we're getting it ready to frost seed or, or intercede with a no-till drill. We want to get it grazed close and we want it grazed tight. And we want to keep it grazed tight until those seedlings start to come up. So the second step is to get good soil to seed contact. So for a, a seed, any seed germinated has to be in contact with the soil. And, and there's various ways to do that. We can frost seed, we can, we can no-till seed, we can use minimum tillage. Some people like to talk about livestock seeding and what is that? That's when I would actually feed the seed to the animal, would go through the digestive system, and come out in the manure and the germinate and come up. This is not really a viable approach. It doesn't work that well. We uh, can't keep a viable inoculum on the legume seed. Um, and then some seeds don't make it all the way through the digestive tract. So kind of cross that one off your list, but I did want to mention it because we often see it in, in magazines. So regardless of what method we use, the goal is always the same, and that's to get good soil to seed contact. So we've got to have that seed in contact with the soil to germinate and come up. Probably the the cheapest and most effective way to get clover back into our pastures is using what we call frost seeding. And frost seeding is simply broadcasting that seed on the soil in late winter or very early spring and allowing the freezing and thawing cycles between day and night to cause little fissures or cracks to form the soil that incorporates that seed into the soil. Again, we want those pastures that we're going to frost seed to be grazed very closely prior to broadcasting that seed onto the soil surface so they can find uh, the soil and get incorporated through this freezing and thawing. Works best with red and white clover, not so well with alfalfa and grasses. 
Um, preparation again begins the previous summer. We want to again uh, soil test and just fertility. We want to if we have any really bad persistent broadleaf weeds, we need to control those prior to um, seeding clover in because we don't have any herbicides that will kill a broadleaf weed, not kill our clover plants. And then we want to res reduce uh, residue uh, by grazing hard prior to, and suppress the sod prior to frost seeding. Things that will enhance our success include the amount of plant residue. We've got to manage that prior, so graze close. We want to make sure we get the seed on in a timely manner so that we have adequate flying cycles. In, in our part of the world, it's going to be somewhere around mid-February or, or even a little bit earlier to make sure that seed has plenty of freezing and thawing cycles to get into the soil. Uh, we want to seed, get the seed on early. We want to control competition after seeding. That's really critical. A lot of times, We'll, when we have a, a failure with the frost seeding, it's because the sod has grown up around those seedlings, which have a very limited root system, and is actively competing for light, water, and nutrients. If we can suppress that sod through hard grazing before those seedlings come up and just after they start to come up, then we're going to have a much better chance of success with frost seeding. Want to make sure we use high quality seed, use the correct amount, make sure the seed's inoculated, and make sure we get even seed distribution. And getting even seed distribution can be a little bit more difficult than, than it seems when you're driving in a pasture with a four wheeler with a spinner spreader on it. Um, it can be a little bit of a challenge to uh, get a uniform distribution. And that's kind of where this little um, device comes up. This is a, a portable GPS unit that we can put on an ATV and actually spread. And I'm going to show you just a little bit of data. Uh, we did a study a couple of years ago with a couple of my technicians. And um, we did two things. We initiated the GPS unit. And then we covered that. So it's recording where we're going. And then I asked my technician to go ahead and overseed four pastures. And they ranged in size from, I think, six to 10 acres. And, um, and, and then we did the same thing again. We initiated the GPS and then we uncovered it and allowed him to use it for guidance in that pasture. And these were, were our two participants. We had Connor Raymond, from, uh, who was a graduate of Murray State University, and then Brittany Hendricks, a graduate of North Carolina State University. And so it was a little bit of a competition to see who could do a better job. And, and this was the in, most interesting part that I want to show you. And this is the amount of overlap. So getting too close together in that pasture. And when we looked in 2019, when Connor was driving, he had 50% um, overlap without GPS guidance, 3% with GPS guidance. When we look at Brittany in 2021, she had only 21% overlap without guidance and 3.5% with guidance. So overall, it averaged 35% overlap between the two years, which is a significant seed cost. So I'm, I'm putting down essentially a third more seed than I actually needed because I'm trying to compensate because I have I can't tell where I've been in that pasture. So Brittany won this part of the um, part of the competition here. Some of the maps that we generated from this, and we can see in this map on the upper left how much overlap that we have in this particular pasture because he wasn't quite sure where he was in this pasture. This is with guidance, same pasture with guidance. It's almost a perfect um, uh, seeding distance apart. So if we just look real quick at the economics of buying a system, and, and I'm not an economist, so I call this economist by an agronomist or agroeconomics. If, if we have something that uh, relatively low cost operation like overseeding clover, which would be between 20 and, and $40 usually, um, and we've got a, an overlap of 20%, then we can recoup the cost of that GPS unit, which is about $1,500 in a, uh, as little as 375 acres. Now, as the cost of that operation goes up, so say we're spreading fertilizer, and usually we just do it by site, but, um, 
but we use the GPS unit instead. If there was a 20% overlap in the cost of the fertilizer cost $70 per acre, we could recoup the in savings, the cost of that GPS unit in, in 107 acres. So real quick summary was uh, overlap was large, was a larger issue than skips in this study. We averaged 35%. GPS unit reduced overlap to 3%, and we recouped the cost of the GPS in approximately 222 acres. The, the nice thing about these units is that they're really easy to transfer between implements. So we can put them on an ATV, we can put them on a truck, we can put it on a, uh, a litter spreader. It doesn't really matter. We can take them and put them on anywhere. Even when we're no-tilling, often it's hard to see where you have no-tilled into a pasture. So using a GPS unit is an important part of, um, of keeping you on track, even with a no-till drill in the pasture. And when we use them for multiple operations, we're gonna get the payback even sooner. Okay, I think I'm about, 45 minutes into the talk. So I think I'm going to stop here and just answer some questions that you all have, if that's okay. Matthew, uh, down there in Southern part of the state there, extension agent, uh, he asked uh, Dr. Deutsch, uh, should we test hay fields more often than grazing pastures, uh, being that we're not removing more nutrients than they in putting it back, uh, let's see, we're not removing more nutrients that are not being put back on last by last. Right. Yeah, you know, that's not a bad idea. You know, pastures, if you're testing every two to three years, I think you're doing pretty good. Hay fields are really, um, you know, our recommendation is two to three years. But if you're in an intensive hay management system where you're really pushing those hay fields to get um, optimal yields, then really it would be ideal to be testing every year in those hay fields. I had a, Dr. Toys, I had a, Producer, he'll be watching the recorded version of it here today, I'm sure, but uh, later on. But he was asking, and we did maybe talk about, uh, he's wanting to see this uh, uh, fall, I guess, uh, dates that we have. And um, he's, of course, has a, you know, a fescue clover type uh, area there that he's uh, looking at, field. Uh, and so he was wondering, you know, would it be better you know, for forage, for dollars, uh, you know, going back in with maybe a, you know, maybe some rye or a wheat or something, you know, uh, should he, he's wanting to renovate. So he, have you gotten any of those, uh, a take on that uh, versus cost, maybe? He's uh, well, most bang for his buck. Yeah, so, so um, you know, it was interesting. I was talking to one of our extension agents this afternoon about that, and, um, Often people will want to come in this time of the year and intercede a cool season annual into pastures. And that, I mean, it can work, but for that to really be successful, you have to have a pretty thin sod. And um, that sod has to be dominated by summer annual grasses like, uh, say, crabgrass or a foxtail or something like that. If you have a good, healthy sand of fescue, even though it was pretty dry, it, when the water comes, um, that fescue is going to be pretty competitive with a winter annual. And often we don't get the results that we think we should with the winter annuals. I'm not saying it can't work, but really if, if I'm managing, if, if I'm wanting to get the most out of the dollars that I'm spending on an annual, and annuals tend to be fairly expensive in grazing systems, I, I want to have it in, the, in an environment where I have the least amount of competition. So if I had a crop field or maybe I had a field that I chopped for silage, that would be a great place to put an annual in that system. Or if I have a pasture that I wanna renovate, say I'm trying to take a, a fescue out of a, or like a toxic fescue out, or I have a really thin stand, I can go, go ahead and just spray it out right now, this time of summer, and then intercede an annual it can be a good place. And then come back with a summer annual that following spring and then do a fall seeding of a perennial grass back into that system. So in my take on annuals, and I just had a graduate student that um, finished her thesis. And when I read her, her she wrote two economics chapters on summer annuals. I, I almost cried because the economics were so bad on the, on the annuals. Not saying but you have to use them very strategically within a grazing system and, and transitioning between perennial sods is a, a good way to use them. 
Yeah, good. Thank you much. We have another uh, question in the chat from Mr. Joe West. Uh, it says, I have had limited success with frost seeding of clover in Middle Tennessee. Can we no-till in clover in the fall with any success? The, the answer is yes. And, and I had some no-till slides, but I, I kind of cut myself off because I could have gone for another, you know, 25 or 30 minutes. Um, but but no-till is actually a, a, a fairly good way to introduce um, clover back into pastures. And you would follow the same kind of the same guidelines. You'd want to graze that pasture really close, as close as you can get it grazed in late summer early fall to open that sod up and then and then go ahead and no-till those uh, legumes into your pasture. You want to make sure that your seeding depth's not too deep. One of the common problems with no-till drills is that we get it deeper than half an inch. It's really easy to do. Make sure that you have your drill calibrated properly and uh, and then you want to control competition after seeding. So a, a lot of times people will either frost seed or they will no-till and they'll take the animals out immediately. And that's probably not the best scenario. The best scenario is you leave those animals in there and you're worried about them killing some of the seedlings that are germinating and they will do that. I mean, they're gonna walk on some, they're gonna nip some off. But um, if, if you leave them in there, they're gonna keep that sod grazed down and that's gonna reduce the competition for those developing seedlings. You gotta remember those seedlings are coming from a, a really small seed in, they're trying to get a root system established and they're not really competitive with that existing sod. So anything that we can do to keep that sod suppressed while they're germinating and emerging is gonna be really important. And you'll get to the point where, where the seedlings come up and they're starting to get nipped off by the animals, then you should move the animals out and then allow the seedlings to get established. Very good. Uh, invite anyone else with uh, some questions, you know, uh, chat, put it in the chat box or turn on your microphone. We'll let you get in and uh, talk, uh, ask you a question there. Uh, I see some other agent, uh, Billy Garrett there. Are you in your, again, anybody have any questions? Uh, Chris? I got one, Keith. Yes, sir, Philip. Uh, Dr. Tush, thank you. Uh, this spring, I'm, I'm always trying to do something different, see what happens. And I left off a strip with no nitrogen. And after four weeks, I couldn't tell the difference. Couldn't tell much difference in two and three weeks, but I couldn't tell any difference after four weeks and can't tell any, any today. Uh, does that line up with what you've seen? And so so I, I think it I think it's gonna depend greatly on your system. It sounds like you've you've done a pretty good your, your grazing system and you've got a pretty strong nitrogen cycle in that system. Have you worked on legumes, getting legumes in your system and yeah. your rotational yeah. stocking? Yeah, so, so what you've done is developed a pretty strong nitrogen cycle and it's, it's kind of interesting, you know, when we talk about stockpiling grass in the fall, we always talk about putting 60 to 80 pounds of nitrogen on. And what people with improved grazing systems that have noticed is that they don't get the response to that nitrogen that we, we often think we should. Um, and that's because we've developed a strong nitrogen cycle within that grazing system. So I think what you've done is exactly right. And that's what more people should be doing is, is leaving some strips out and seeing if, if their inputs are really paying for themselves. And that's gonna vary from farm to farm. Um, we had a hay field, I'll just, take a minute and tell you about a study that my, I've got a student working on right now. So we, we had a, a hay field on the research station, which was pretty nitrogen deficient. And we came in in the fall and put nitrogen down, but not, not like people normally do. We came in and put that nitrogen down on December 1st. And you're saying, well, boy, that's way too late for that nitrogen to do anything. And you're absolutely right. It didn't do much in the fall. But, but what it did was it got that plant ready to grow. And this is something they've known in the turf grass industry forever. I mean, they always recommend fall nitrogen. And what we found was that when, when we um, put that nitrogen down in the fall, those pots greened up earlier, and they grew, grew more in this early spring, and then they yielded more in hay. So that following spring, we put additional nitrogen on over all the plots and we still had a response 
of 22 pounds of dry matter per unit of nitrogen applied in the fall, even with 80 pounds of nitrogen in the spring. Wow. So, so it's kind of a neat, kind of a neat study. We repeated it the spring. We still need to analyze our data um, from the second year of the study, but the fall fertilization is something the turf grass industry has been practicing for a long time. I don't know why we've never really looked at it for, uh, for producers. Now, again, if you had a strong nitrogen cycle like you described, you're probably not going to get that nitrogen response that we saw in this, in this tall fescue hay field. Great, great question, Phil. Thank you. We talked about that at the fair last week. Appreciate yeah. you bringing that up. Uh, anyone else, uh, if you'd like to turn your microphone on, that instead of typing it in the chat box, you're welcome to do that. Um, here's one. Um, let's see. Um, Mr. West, again, uh, best month to no-till the clover in. Uh, thanks for that. Best month to no-till the clover in. Well, we either uh, early spring would, would be ideal as uh, soil start to warm up, or we can do it in the fall like we just discussed. Either one of those can work with the no-till drill. We probably don't want to do it in February. We probably want to move into March before we, we do that mid-March to late March. Um, if we're no-tilling. The reason we put the frost seeding out earlier is we, we're counting on that freezing and heaving action of the uh, soil to incorporate that seed. All right, anyone else? Uh, again, great opportunity. Uh, one of our vet, best forage specialists in the Southeast here. Uh, so uh, again, I know I, Pester a lot of our specialists over in Kentucky with lots of questions here being on the line and everything. So uh, we um, sure appreciate Dr. Toich taking his time here tonight to be with us. Anyone else? Hey, can I can I show just a couple slides? Please do. I'm gonna skip to the end here, guys. And in, in this, these handouts are available from, uh, from your agents there. I sent a, co a copy of the handouts to them if you'd like a copy. So I'll just end with my pasture renovation checklist. So soil test and adjust fertility is needed. Uh, make sure that, that what your plant is adapted. I didn't, didn't get a chance to talk about that, but we were talking about um, this afternoon about Timothy. And, and Timothy is a great forage, but it's not really well adapted to Western Kentucky. So kind of acts almost like a annual or short-lived perennial. So make sure what your planning is adapted to, to where you're at. Implement rotational stocking, control broadleaf weeds, incorporate legumes back into your pasture, reseed pastures as a last resort. And I just wanted to end with a couple uh, our resources that you could use. Dr. Torch, we, uh, we may want to share your screen. We're not seeing there. Oh. Some I'm sorry. Thank you. All right, hold on a second here. Sorry, guys. I'm seeing him. Hold on. I'm coming back. I'm sharing my screen now. Thank you for uh, pushing that there. Okay. How about now? There you go. Yeah, oh, maybe in the full screen. Yeah. Let's see, I've got to move a couple things around. To Okay, I just wanted to end with a couple of resources that, that we have that could benefit you all. One is our, our YouTube page. If you search KY Forge's YouTube, uh, you'll find this page, and it's got hundreds of videos on all sorts of forages and livestock. So it's a great resource. Um, I think last year we had about a hundred and 170 or 5,000 views on this page. Um, we got a, a, a great UK Forages webpage, and we've got a, a section on here um, called the Forage News. It's published once a month. If you're interested in getting this, you can click right on here on our Forage page. 
subscribe to the newsletter and you'll get a PDF version at the first of every month. We're religious about getting it out in the first of every month. Got upcoming events, so if you want to find out about grazing schools or whatever, you can go there and uh, uh, find out about upcoming events. Simply Google UKY Forages and it'll be the first thing that pops up. Just want to mention our variety testing program. We have one of the most extensive variety testing programs in the country in Kentucky. Uh, Gene Olson gets all the credit for that. He's our technician that runs that program. Um, and we can, you can find the data by clicking on these icons. We've got 12 icons and you can click on um, variety trial icon and it will take you to the forage variety trial page. And the most important publication on this page is one called the long-term summary. And it, it shows um, data over years for different varieties. And it looks like this, and I know this is too small to read, I, I, but the most important part column of this table is this last column and it shows um, the performance of varieties in relation to the average variety in the trial. So if it's 100, it's average for the trial. If it's below 100, it's below average performing. If it's above 100, it's above average. And I'll just point one out, for example, here's 110. So the number in the parentheses is, is the number of site years this variety was tested. So this particular variety was tested 28 times or 28 years, site years. And that could be, uh, site year would be Princeton in 2018 and another site year would be uh, Lexington in 2018. So tested 28 times. So when we have five or six or more site years, we feel pretty confident about that number. And that happened to be Kenlin certified seed. Kenlin's a red clover, and it's uh, one that was developed at the University of Kentucky. It's an older variety, but still a very good variety. And you want to make sure that you get certified seed, and I'll show you why here. So right below it is, is 70, so that's 30% below average, six site years. And that's Kenlin too, but it's uncertified seed. When you buy certified seed, you know that what you're paying for is in that bag. If it's uncertified, they can call it Kenlin but it doesn't mean you're getting Kenlin in the bag. And that's what the, and I'm done. And I'll just end with my um, contact information. You're always welcome to call or email me.